invitation. And I'm here with you because I'm glad to worship the living God with you. Just a few things to keep uh, at the front of your mind, um, and they are in um, our bulletin. Last week, of course, was Catch-Up Sunday, and we played such a strong part, and we had such a strong reaction to, to that Stewardship Sunday. Thank you for the parts that we all played and for us coming together as a church family through that. Um, our Operation uh, Christmas Child information is listed in the bulletin, um, and Miss Sandra gave us a wonderful announcement about how our mission project this year, uh, excuse me, this month, is to get connected and do a, um, an Operation Christmas Child online. And, and so I encourage you to go about that pathway. Um, we have Vacation Bible School on the way, um, and there's a planning meeting coming up June the 1st, is that right, 6 o'clock? Um, so make sure that if you're a part, and if you're, if you're not a part of Vacation Bible School, I'm going to make just a small, serious joke, okay? Shame on you. Everybody, let's play a part because this is a wonderful opportunity to reach out to our community, spread the gospel to families, affect them. Go see Miss Amanda and get involved with volunteering. You volunteer for one day. You can volunteer every single day, and it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Um, graduate recognition is next Sunday, so we're going to gather and, and recognize some of our graduates that are going to be here, uh, and with them, um, we say, you know, way to go. Um, and that's it. You guys read the rest of this because we're also here for worship. And I don't want us to miss what we're here for. So let us turn our hearts over, our minds towards Jesus Christ for who he is and for what he has done to, for us. We're mindful this Memorial Day weekend about those who, who gave up their lives, those families who surrendered something for us so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have. We're mindful of Jesus Christ who did give his life up for us that we might have eternal freedom. I've invited David McCauley, McCauley, I did that the other day, Mulkey, to come and, and pray over us our Memorial Day prayer. One of our current heroes. All right, it's on. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day weekend, we remember and give thanks for those who have given their lives in the service of our country. When the need was greatest, they stepped forward to defend the freedoms that we enjoy and to win the same for others. May the examples of their sacrifice inspire in us the selfless love of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. God, you yourself have taught us that no love is greater than than that which gives it for another. These honored dead give, gave the most precious gift they had, life itself, for loved ones and neighbors, for comrades and country, and for us. Bless the families of our fallen troops and fill their homes and their lives with your strength and peace. Help us to honor their memory by caring for the Gold Star families, by ensuring that our wounded are properly cared for, and by being caretakers of the freedoms for which they gave their lives. Help us to remember that freedom is not free. The times when its cost is indeed dear. Never let us forget those who paid so terrible a price to ensure that freedom would be our legacy. Though their names may fade with passing of generations, we will never forget what they have done. Help us to be worthy of their sacrifice. Embolden us to answer the call to work for peace and justice and to seek an end to the violence and conflict around the globe. Move us to know, take hold, and to treasure your saving grace. We ask this through your name. Amen. Amen. That's right. Oh, precious Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. In you, for you, and through you were all things created. Yet you humbled yourself to become man. And we can also call you our friend. We love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord. But forgive us when our actions don't reflect that we love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
Help us to live those truths and demonstrate our love and gratitude by our obedience to you. Lord, we are so grateful for those who gave their all for our freedoms. As we ponder this and we remember them, our thoughts cannot help but go to you. For you gave your life on the cross to give us ultimate freedom from sin and the gift of eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, the sinless, spotless lamb for your blood that was shed once for all. Because you live, we as your followers will live also. Thank you, Jesus, for being our friend and savior. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to pull them out to, um, and, and we'll carry forward with that in just a few moments. Uh, First Peter chapter 4. Um, and of course, uh, so thankful to worship with you here today. For those that are joining us online, we invite you to come and join us here because we believe that, that disciple making, that, that church, amen, that church is best together. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to worship in a nation that's free. Um, because uh, we've some of us have been to places where it's not free, and uh, so thankful for this space. Um, uh, just just a few things as we begin in um, to our time together. Um, I'm reminded that we are in the middle of, uh, or we're not in the middle. We're at the end of this this series that we've been called calling seismic shifts. Okay, are you with me? Seismic shifts because we're trying to go from good. To great, like like what what is that step where where we go from good, not just being good, but but to greatness? And and you remember we were talking about McDonald's last week, and how Ray Kroc and McDonald's had to figure out that it wasn't about the hamburger; it was about the land that they were on, to make them from a good hamburger company to a global hamburger company. Okay, so so what would it take in your life, in your life right now? To take that step from good to great. Because in some way, in some way, good is the enemy of greatness. Because sooner or later we convince ourselves that good is good enough and we stop try, striving for great. Okay, we just stop striving for great. We, good is okay. Well, how many times have we heard somebody say that's a really good person? But, but we stop striving for greatness. I'm going to take this just one step for the last week. Of course, we were talking about financial stewardship and the seismic shift that everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. And since everything belongs to God, we live like everything belongs to him. We return it to him. We, we talked about financial stewardship. And so I'm, I'm going to make a, a general statement with this. We think that that. That financial stewardship is good. I think it's good. But today we're going to discover that grace stewardship is the best. We're, we're going to discover that grace stewardship is great. Um, Jerry Rice, um, do you all know who Jerry Rice is? If you don't know who Jerry Rice is, I'm so sorry. Man, it's like a national treasure. Um, Jerry Rice, of course, played football um, in the NFL. And uh, when, when he was playing in high school, he was tempted to quit because his coach made them run the 40-yard dash on, an, on a mountain, on, a, on an uphill incline. And so it was a struggle to run that. And about the 11th time they had to run that wind sprint of 40 yards, he was about to walk out, out the field and quit. I mean, he was headed towards the locker rooms, and this voice came inside of his mind, uh, that just said, don't quit, don't give up. And he dug in a little bit harder and he ran a little bit longer and kept on going on those 40. And there was a, a cornerback, um, Kevin Brown, I think. Kevin uh, said of Jerry Rice that while they were um, at practice and they, they had their NFL season, that everybody else took time away to go and rest. Except for Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice competed 12 months out of the year. On the day after their last regular season game, 
Jerry would get up, he would go find that proverbial mountain, and he would work out just like it was the middle of the season. Because, and this is what that cornerback said, he figured out what was great. Figured out what was great. And he was a great football player, national treasure. We already said all of that. What would it take? What would it take for you in your life to make the step from good to great? Maybe like Jerry, maybe like Jerry, we'll figure out today that our pursuits should be continual in the kingdom of God. That we don't take a vacation from who he is and what he's doing. We don't stop for three months of the year. Hint, hint. We're about to enter into summer. We don't. We do this 12 months of every year, every day, all the time. Maybe that's our step today to greatness. First Peter. First Peter chapter 4. We're going to read through a few of these passages together. Um. I'm going to pick up in verse 7 and I'm going to read all the way through to verse 11. Would you please stand with me as we read God's word together? The end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober minded so that you be alert and sober minded so that you may pray above all. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things, in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Um, so in all of that, I, I'm only going to focus on verse 10 today. Okay? So, so let's just... Let's just go back to to put our minds on verse 10 for a minute. Okay, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In in first Peter um, chapter four, we kind of get a, a, a description of kingdom living. What does it mean? Man, we've talked about the kingdom of God everywhere today. Junior's back there laughing at me. What does it mean to live as a kingdom citizen? And in in the first century, in the first century, to be a kingdom citizen, are you ready? To be a kingdom citizen did not just mean that you gave a tenth. It meant that you gave your life. Stewardship meant... I give my entire life to Jesus Christ. He talks about being uh, about the end times coming near in verse seven. The end times are coming. You know, we hear that just as prolifically today as they did in their time, because we think everything's a sign of the coming of the end coming. Uh, The end is coming. So therefore, the response is be sober minded, be clear minded. Don't get focused on the wrong thing. Get focused on the right thing. Be sober minded, clear minded. Okay, because the end is coming and love one another. Well, since the end is coming, I love this. Love one another. Well, and that love is spelled out because we don't grumble and complain and judge and compare everybody. Instead, we pray. Instead, we offer grace and instead we offer mercy. Instead, we we find a way to pull people to the kingdom and and to promote Jesus Christ instead. And then verse 10, each. Can we just can we just camp on each for one minute? Each is a really powerful word. Each means 
everybody. Now, you remember the first two lessons about, about seismic shifts. Seismic shift number one was everything belongs to God. Everything. That means I'm everything. That means, that means blades of grass, but that means me. That means my house, my kids, my wife, my truck. Oh, man, I, it's rough to surrender your truck, right? You know, I mean, it means everything. I mean, we might make a joke about it, but if he owns everything, that means my bank account. It means my thoughts. It means my heart. It means this nation that we get to enjoy. It means this world we call planet Earth. Everything means everything. So if everything belongs to him, I want to conduct my life like it does. I want to live like God owns everything in every way. And because he owns everything in every way, he has a resource that he uses each, it's the greatest, it's a great resource. Each means you. Each means everything. Each means you. That means that you have a purpose in the kingdom of God. You have a part of the plan to play. Each includes you. Each has a purpose. Now we're going to get into the purpose in just a few minutes. But each has a purpose. We've got to remember right now today that each includes you. Now, right now, you're sitting there thinking, because you know where I'm going, because you know me really well. We're going to start talking about missions and evangelism and outreach in just a minute. So generally, along this time, I start to get some reasoning. The I can't reasons. Do you know the I can't reasons? Some of us have, have shared them. I can't because I'm too busy. And I'm going to say some sassy things if they step on your feet. They're, they're not intended to. They're, they're mainly meant to, to step on my feet. I, I, I'm too busy. I'm so thankful that Jesus wasn't too busy to go to the cross for us. I'm, I'm too tired. Can you imagine him saying that in the Garden of Gethsemane? I'm too tired. You, you, some of us have used I've used that. I'm too tired. I'm, I'm, too, I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I'm too tired. I have a lack of knowledge. I don't know what to say. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't because I have a lack of experience. I can't. Each, each now has totally excluded any I can't. And we should turn our I can'ts around into I can. Yes, I can. Because each includes you. That means you have a purpose Yes, you can. Yes, we can. Yes, I can. Yes, you can. And this is a sense of hope because remember, just like last week, we're going to throw away all guilt because guilt doesn't help make everlasting change. Jesus does. That's why we surrender to Jesus Christ. That's why in this area, we want to pray today, Heavenly Father, I am a part of each. I'm a part of each. Show me what my purpose is. Show me what part I play. Show me. We don't have to be afraid of that. That's a dangerous prayer though, isn't it? Because if He shows us, then we've got to do something with that. I brought uh, uh, one of my collector's editions with me this morning. This is a joke. This is not a collector's edition. Um, this is a unique guitar. Um, it's unique for two or three reasons. Um, because it has more than six strings on it and it is old. There you go. That's a little better. A little out of tune though. All right. Uh, this is called a 12-string guitar um, and it totally serves the purpose of a lesson for us this morning. I found this 12-string guitar on the side of a highway between Saginaw and Newark, Texas. Side of a highway. Just no strings, just thrown down there. Um, I found this over there at the side of a highway Picked it up and said, well, I'm going to clean that thing up, put new strings on it and start playing it. And so you know what I did? I picked it up, cleaned it up, got some, some oil out, new strings. These are not new strings. And I started playing it 25 years ago for students in student ministry. And this guitar reminds me at all times. The I can't can. Because whether we feel like we're broken Feel like we're to the side. Can't be used. We're no longer usable. Yes, you can. God has a purpose. Each means us. And God has a purpose. 
for us. Greatest purpose, greatest purpose. Are you ready? To display the great glory of God in, as in Jesus Christ. That's my greatest purpose. I, if I could, I would bring this guitar up. We could hallelujah some more. Great job this morning. We could, but you, it's, Because he's worth it. For the rest of my life, I have a purpose that's worth it to sing and to manifest the glory of God in every practical way. Because he owns everything, shouldn't I use everything for his glory? Amen? Everything for his glory. Each includes you and I. and We have a purpose. Now, I wish that I could tell each one of you specifically today what your purpose is. I wish. I can give you some general things today. I want you, I want you to know some general things. Yes. But yes, also God has a specific purpose for your life. He's planted you in a family. Your first mission field. He's planted you in a neighborhood. Your second mission field. He's planted you uh, with a, a, a history that you bring to today. You have a purpose that's specific for your life. Each becomes a powerful word. Because it includes you and me. But the, the, the dangerous part here is, are you ready? Nobody is excluded from each. Everybody's in each. Nobody gets a pass. If you thought you had a pass, no. Everybody is a part of each. Each what in verse 10? Each of you should use whatever gift. Each of you should use. And should, for some reason, makes us think that we have an option. You know, like, shoulda, woulda, coulda. We've heard that phrase many times. Like, should, should, should in some way gives us an option. That is a fallacy. Okay? We have an option to disobey. We have an option to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. Should should be must. Can we just can we just use must for a minute? Can we just use must just for let me let me reread that with just the word must in there. Each of you must use whatever gift you have received to serve others. You've been given a gift. Now um, the nature of a gift is unique in our definition because we think that you that I've been given a gift and I can do whatever I want with it. When does a gift become something more? When it has strings attached to it. You know, like when your parents gave you the first car keys and then you had to, you thought that was a gift and then you had to take your siblings everywhere. That's not really a gift, is it? When does a gift become something more? When you start holding value in your family and playing a part by getting the opportunity to drive your siblings to school and back, excuse me, to school and back. And your, your status gets raised up and your responsibility gets raised up and you're no longer a spectator, but you're a, particip a particip particip participant. Isn't that important? Isn't it important to become a participant instead of a spectator? This gift that Paul is talking about in verse 9 is a gift with a string attached. You received it. Now I'm going to tell you who did the giving. Can you say his name with me? Jesus Christ. Let's say it again. Jesus Christ gave you a gift. The ultimate gift he gave you. Salvation. That if we would confess our sins before him, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and remove all unrighteousness. He lived a perfect life. Life without blemish, not one blemish, but he was one of us and, and, and tempted to sin in every way that we actually do sin in. He was put on a cross to pay my penalty for death, excuse me, my penalty for sin, which is death. He paid my penalty, which means I don't have to pay it anymore. He rose again, demonstrating. Not just that the penalty was paid, but the freedom from death was had too. The question today I have for you is, have you ever received that gift? Because if you're sitting in here and you haven't received that gift, we've got to go there. It's a day if you were to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, His promise is that He will save you forevermore and you have everlasting life. You have life in heaven and life today. 
Would you receive that gift today? Call on His name. Because no other way can we be saved in this world we live in. It is a gift, but it has a string attached. You were given a gift to serve others. The idea of serve gives you the idea that there is a need that is not being met somewhere. It's somehow, somebody has a need that hasn't been met. And you've been given a gift to meet that need. Just like each includes everyone. And we all have a purpose. The purpose is to serve others. And we can serve others in lots of different ways. We can serve others with practical ways that we live. Helping my neighbor out in their yard. Um, serving at the local women's shelter. Crisis, crisis pregnancy group. Bringing food to go to the food bank. I, I can help a, a neighbor build a ramp. I can serve others. But when I'm going to attach it to grace. There's an ultimate service that can, be, that can happen. Just like you were saved and given the ultimate gift in, in Jesus Christ. That ultimate gift has a purpose. And that you're supposed to use it. To share with other people. God has a resource. And that resource is grace. And he wants it. To be shared. But let's, let's again turn to. To chapter. Excuse me. Chapter 4 verse 10. Each of you should use. Whatever gift you have received. To serve others. As faithful stewards. You know when I think of stewards. I think of Ted. Do you know Ted. Jeffrey knows Ted. Daryl knows Ted. Miss Amanda knows Ted. We met Ted when we went to our mission trip to Moldova. Ted is a giant in my sight. He's just a giant. Let me tell you why he's a giant. Ted lives over in the Charlotte area. He spends two weeks at home and then he flies every single month. I know it blows my mind. Every month he chooses to get on a plane and flies to New York City. Where in New York City, for the other two weeks, he serves the homeless and shares with them Jesus Christ. Because Ted figured something out. He was given a gift that he was supposed to use. And so he did it. Now, we would say Ted is being radical. Ted is like, man, like the hero of faith. And no, Ted is normal. Ted is not radical. It is the expectation that he's been given the gift of grace Therefore, he should take that gift and use it to serve others. God gave him the specific ability and task to do it in New York City. But you've got the same one. It just might not involve the same location. We've been given a purpose. And that purpose is to serve others. And our ultimate service to others is Jesus Christ. And then Paul, Peter, excuse me, uses these wonderful words. Wonderful words. I mean... When I'm studying about stewardship, you know, I'm thinking financial stewardship. Because when we think of stewardship, what do we think of? Money. We think of stewardship, we think of offerings. We think of tithing. We think, but, but if God owns everything, and we've got to live like He owns everything, that means that every part of my life, I've got to steward back to Him. So now when I think of steward, I'm doing my studying, and I read 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, and steward of grace seems so big to me right now. You've been given a gift. Each one of us has received as stewards of grace. Because he owns everything. And the greatest thing that he owns is grace. And he stewarded that to you. He gave that to you. And now you're the steward of it. He gave you grace. And now you're the steward of it. I've, I've failed. I've failed in the last three weeks to define steward on purpose to wait for today. I'm so excited. Can I define steward with you for a minute? A steward is someone that the owner of a property or owner of a corporation hires. They hire them for a purpose that they might use the owner's resources to manage the affairs of the owner. Okay? A steward has been charged by an owner to manage the affairs of the owner using the owner's resources. A steward's not asked to do it by their own resources because the resources, because generally they don't have the resources of the owner. The owner is more powerful, has more resources, and so they get tasked 
to look over the affairs of the, of the owner using his own resources so they're entrusted with something and they've got to do something with it. The key is when they figured out what they're supposed to be doing is what the owner did with it. He wants it to be used for his family. He wants it to be used for his business. He wants the resource to go out over his affairs. The steward is tasked with taking the owner's resources and distributing them over the affairs. You've been given everything. You've been given grace. and You've been tasked by the owner who owns everything, God above in heaven, to go out and expand His grace by sharing it with everything. Everything. Not just a few. We're not just the same in this space over and over and over again. Because if everything belongs to Him, that means some person that we've never met in Moldova or, or in some other foreign country or in California or on the other side of Mamie Bell uh, Ridge where I live. Because they're all His. And we're all tasked to steward His grace over all of those people. Now let me tell you specifically how you can steward them. Number one, we steward them by inviting somebody to come to church with me. This is a place where people can encounter, can encounter Jesus Christ. And so as good stewards, we go out and invite people to come to church for us. As good stewards. You know what a great steward is? When we personally feel the passion of the owner to go and take the same grace to that person. And how did the owner take it to us? He died on the cross for us. That means I'm going to give up my life. That means I'm going to live in a passionate way. I'm going to be just as passionate about grace and stewarding it as Jesus Christ was when He stewarded it to me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up in life. I'm not going to take a vacation. I'm not, I'm not going to break from the stewardship of grace that we've been challenged with. I want to instead be as passionate as Jesus Christ was about stewarding grace. See, it's good to steward money. Good to steward money. Money comes and grows. It's great to steward grace because when we steward grace, we might bring people into an everlasting relationship with Jesus Christ. We might connect them with the community of faith. That means that in every way, I want to invite somebody to church because I'm passionate about stewarding grace just as passionate as Jesus was about saving me. Because I've been charged as a steward to take his rule and his reign, his, his authority, his resources. And I've fallen just as in love with that as anything else in my life. Not only do I want to invite people, I want to invite others to come and enjoy my Christian experience, which is not perfect because I'm sinful. So yours won't be either. But I want to invite somebody. I want to say to somebody in a practical way, would you like to come to my house Read God's word so that I can tell you about who Jesus was. I know, I know that's not really good Christianese in the world that we live in. But I don't have to talk Christianese. I just want to invite somebody to join my Christian life. Because I'm passionate about the Savior who died for me. And I'm passionate to share the grace that He shared with me. Not only, not only do I want to invite somebody to do uh, life with me. I want to take this grace to the uttermost parts of the earth. Everywhere. I, I, I feel called just as Jesus Christ because Christianity did not start in America. It started in the Middle East when Christ died. And somehow he found a way to get it over here to me. I want to take it from me all over the world. I'm passionate about it because, because Jesus was passionate about giving it to me. And I'm just charged as a steward. I'm just charged as a steward to do the same thing that he did. That's it. That does mean that I'm going to step out and say some things in a bold way because that's what Jesus did. And I'm charged to share the grace. That does mean that, that I, might, I might have the opportunity to share with somebody who Jesus Christ is or just invite them to my Bible study group. I want to invite you today to be a great commission 
Christian. Do you remember the Great Commission? Found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. We're given a task to go to share Christ, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And remember the end promised. He's going to be with us always, but it's all of ours. Every one of us is a Great Commission Christian. Here's the danger. George Barna and uh, Lutzer put out a, um, an article about three or four years ago that of the 7,000, how many? 7,000 churches they interviewed. The vast majority of those churches involved people on the, that in the vast majority of the way were not involved in meaningful ministry and missions that reached out to the least loved and least cared for. That means there's a danger in this room right now, right now, that some of us might not be Great Commission Christians. But the task is given to every one of us. And that's the call for us today. Because Jeffrey Carroll said it right. We were standing out beside of us, beautiful hillside in Moldova, and, and our little um, uh, clay-colored structure that was quite better than every other third world country that we've been into. We have cut grass. We have painted trees. We, have, we didn't really paint trees like with, with what we can see. We put herbicide and, spec and pesticide on trees. So that, that's what painting trees was like. And I don't remember what Jeff and I were doing, but it was the first time he said it, and it just stuck. It stuck with me so much. It stuck with me for, what, what are we, two weeks out now, Jeff? It stuck with me so much that for that week, in Moldova, he said, in some way, I'm going to butcher your quote, that we were in the right place doing the right thing. And how many people can say that with their lives right now? Can you say that you're in the right place doing the right thing right now? Are you expanding his kingdom? Are you a great commission Christian? Are you doing that right now? Now, we went a world away to do it, but you know what? I'm giving the same charge right here. The same thing right here. And I want to be involved in meaningful ministry and meaningful missions. And trust me, I, I want to share with you, I have, I have a one-step plan. One-step plan and it's going to revolution. It's you. You're it. In a few minutes, we're going to pray and you're going to be given the opportunity to surrender that I am passionate about spreading the grace of Jesus Christ. And then tag. The old proverbials. Tag. You're it. Go do it. Yes you can. Yes. Yes you can. Because outside those doors. Outside those doors. Is where we will find the great mission field. That needs grace stewarded to them. It's great. It's great when we remember Stewardship involves grace. And I want to share it. Um, so th th this may have hit you in a few ways. Number one, I hope it stirred your heart to be a missionary. To be a missionary right now. Right here. Be because, because then I believe we can say, I absolutely, when we're on mission, sharing His grace, sharing the gospel, that means that I can say to myself, I'm in the right place, doing the right thing. I think the second thing you can get from this is, is maybe you thought that each did not include you. That because you're too busy or too tired. But today you hear the call and you think each includes me. Amen. Each includes me. That you've seen the great purpose that Christ has given you with a beautiful gift of grace. And you commit today to be a great steward of His grace. But maybe you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And today you want to call on His name. Commit your life to Him. Because this is no longer, it's no longer a game. Because the first century Christians, when they looked at themselves, they didn't say, hmm, I'm too tired today. I'm too busy. First century Christians, when they became Christians, understood the call was for their entire lives. Amen.
Heavenly Father, as we, as we contemplate this heavy calling of mission today, Father, please lift us up and call us, not by my words, but by your Spirit. Spirit, call us to your mission. Call us today. Raise, raise forth harvesters today. Father, some of us have thought that each didn't include us. Or we haven't really taken a hold of the gift today. Father, Father, share your good gift of grace with each one of us that we might share it with others. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You respond today as the Lord has laid it on your heart. Maybe you want to come and join our fellowship or, or ask for baptism or say, I'm a great commissioned Christian and I commit to it now and forevermore. Please stand with me. So as you depart from here, will you commit to being a great commissioned Christian with me? Your first mission field is your family. Those that you hold right next to you. Those that, that have close relationship with you. Share your faith with them. Your second mission field is your neighbor to your neighborhood. Now your neighbor may be three or four miles away, but they're still your neighbor. Or it may be like me and Mamie Bell Ridge. They're my neighbors and they're my first mission field. And I want to steward God's grace into their lives. There are some practical ways you can join the mission field right here with us. You can join a ministry team. You can join the Baptist men. Join the WMU. Join our children. Join our youth because they're going on mission. Are you? Will you be a great commissioned Christian with me? I'm going to invite a Junior to come and close us in a word of prayer. I pray that you have a happy Memorial Day. But as he closes us off in a word of prayer, I'm going to ask that you stay right where you're at. Let us pray. Good morning, Lord. We want to thank you for this day. And Lord, as we go to celebrate Memorial Day, let us remember the, the men and women that sacrificed so that we can have the freedoms that we, that we enjoy in this country. Lord, be with us as we go out. And Lord, our, and witness, and Lord, pray that our nation will return to you. Lord, each one, get one. Lord, each one reach out. Like Daniel said, each is all. And Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that, that you made, that your son made, that I may stand here saved today. Thank you for that salvation. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.